This incredibly simple process that I've developed from <laughs> just a maniac. All right. Okay, so we have a few things to do. Um, <coughs> jelly beans, humans. All right. Um, so the game for this is we're going to do a little estimation. All right. A little bit. This is going to lead into a little, some stuff about voting, fame, success. Jelly beans, famous things. Um, I'm going to pass these around. I want you to feel the weight of these things very quickly. Just even pass it on. There you go. That's it. We're done. No, no physicists. <laughs> Don't pull out a scale. Don't do that. No eating the jelly bean. Well, my second daughter had some strange things to say. Like, did you already count the jelly beans? She said to me. Like, what do you mean? Did you count them? <laughs> why? Why? Only jelly beans. Only the finest quality jelly beans from. Uh, Actually, well, there were two choices from um, City Market. Okay, so we're going to have to play a little, <laughs> little estimation game. What was the line? I don't want to know. All right, so, okay, that's working. Um, okay, so let's, let's just start this off. So here's, here's the thing I want you to do. Let me find a... Okay, good. We've got them. Thank you so much. Jelly beans are good. Okay, so this is a little estimation thing. I've got a few questions for you. I have some forms. So I simply want you to write out, your, just write your, um, just your first name. I think we've got not too much replication of humans, but you can put, put your name. Uh, and then I want your estimate in this first column for a couple of things, right? So the first one is going to be, let's get up. Uh, is this working? Okay. Um, so it's going to be a competition. You get the feast on jelly beans, which I hope you will share with your fellow humans. But uh, closest uh, estimate by percentage of two things. So there are going to be two things I want you to estimate. Right? So how much does this bag weigh? Right. So, write, so, so this is an independent thing. So I want you to write this down on a piece of paper or your computer or whatever it is. Just write down your estimate. You don't have to spend a million years doing this. This is a quick thing. And I'm going to pass this around, and then you will faithfully transcribe what you have written onto this piece of paper not regarding what anyone else has done. We'll, we'll do a group thing later, but this one is just you. How much does it weigh? In ounces. See, not grams. I'm helping you. <coughs> what, are, what are grams? Who knows what grams are? You can put that in grams, right? If you want to put it in grams. You, if you really, all right, all right. Because the metric system is what God wants. No. Ah, tens. tens. I need metric months. <laughs> <laughs> the metric day. See, 60 is awesome. No, no, 60 is fantastic. It is a great, great number. So it's <coughs> 24, 360. The ancient Phoenicians or whoever these maniacs were knew all about it because they're divisible by a lot of numbers. That's really true. So 12, 24, 60. This is what we have going on for the <coughs> hours and minutes and all these things. Kind of sorted that one out. We're, we're in a lot of trouble when it comes to days and the whole, like, planets thing and, yeah, and the moon, what the moon does. Yeah, it makes religion interesting. Uh... So estimate, okay, good, good. You're going to write that down? So also write down the number, so estimate the number of beans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So write down the number of beans, okay, good. And those things you're just going to, you're going to, you're just going to write them down. So please have those numbers down. I'll pass these around and I want you to simply write down your estimates. Now, we have two more estimates. Yeah, so name, first column. And then what's the bulk item number of French lentils at City Market? <coughs> Just write that down. It is a number. I'll give you that. I'm not going to tell you these things. With your one out. Pass. What's that? With your one out. Well, I've got separate sheets for each oh, one. Oh, so, oh. so wait. It, it tells you what it is on top. Look at this. We have headers for the course and everything. Like, very nice. Um, you know, we have a logo, right, people? We have a, lo a T-shirt. Okay. And what's the volume of Neptune in... Cubic miles. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Your estimates, people, don't take too long on those. And then I'm going to talk about some other things. And when, when they get back over to the metaphor person here, um, we're, we're going to, yeah, I'll collect them and we'll talk about some other things. Hmm? I will make some nice graphs based on your estimates. <coughs> Interesting. <coughs> all right, all of those things are independent, right? They're independent. So you should have your estimates written down before they come, come by. Okay, so I've got a, a little bit, all right, while you're thinking about this important thing, and there is, there are jelly beans at the end of this, so, you know, I assume the motivation is high. We have a good number of graduate students here and undergrads, it goes without saying. Um, <coughs> it's interesting to see new professors just transitioning out of being graduate students. They still eat all the pizza they can find, and yeah, anyway, all right. Um, so, social contagion. So we ended with this kind of, all right, we got into some, some scariness. Let me just uh, bring this back up. It is one problem you can have on your problem sets. Uh, so social contagion. Oh, you know what? I'm going to talk. Well, all right. Let me, let me talk about this a little bit, and then I'll show you some other <coughs> fun things. And then we'll get on to, I can't really decide if I want to do scaling or fame. Hmm. All right. Scaling, I guess. All right. all right. We'll see. Okay, so we got to this story for how things spread on random networks with fresh, actually more than just threshold models, but that was our sort of entry into this. These, these are arbitrary uh, local contagion models. So whatever mechanism you have, you, you, you see your friends doing something, whatever it is, you know, coughing, the sputum going on, some bubis, um, bubonic plague, good stuff like that, or uh, they're wearing Ugg boots, whatever it is, right? So there's something going around, you, 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 you have some, and it's built into here, this probability of adoption. You have K friends, J of them are doing something. Coughing. Okay. Um, and we, can't, we got to this, and, and we, can, we can go over it again, but we got to this result, and this is due to Gleason, which is this little theta guy here is the probability that an arbitrary edge in the system at time t plus 1 is infected. So it's all about edges. Many, many calculations for networks is all, all about edges. Um, I wonder if I, I, I really want to use this silly thing. Can I use this thing? No. All right. So... I had a picture here. Okay, good. Um, will it do that? No. <coughs> All right, so there are some problems here. Come on, people. Okay. That was an important thing I just did. Uh, so, all right, so we have our little spreading guy. And it's all, so this is, this is uh, you know, theta of t plus one is out here. This is theta of t. You're, you're interested in, and this, this guy's got all of these inputs to it. You know, is this edge here infected at time t plus 1? And it will depend on what's coming into the node that's, uh, that it's, right? So this edge here, and all of these edges, you, you trace them back. They come from a node which has a bunch of inputs, right? So that's what this, this uh, and it, it really doesn't, and, and it doesn't matter... You know, you, you sum over all the things that could be back out here. It's random, so there's a, that's a big help here. You sum over all the things. There isn't a theta t comma k here, for example. You can do that, but it's just in general, the probability that an arbitrary edge, you just look at an edge somewhere in the network at time t plus 1, and it's infected. All right, that only took a few years. Okay, um, so let's just at least, ma so, you know, that's the visual thing. Mathematically, what's going on is you have this, so say... Uh, J of the um, K friends that this node out, out here has are on, right? You're looking, you're on, a, you're on an edge, you, you look, go back to the node, it has K friends total, including this edge, which is, a, which is an issue. So, so let's say J of those other nodes' edges are on, so that's its probability of, of switching and then emanating towards you. Uh, this is the probability that those edges are on, right? So J of them are on, theta sub T to the J, this is probably that the rest of them are off, so we have to count up properly. And the thing is, we there are k minus 1 other edges, not k. There are k minus 1 other edges. So there are k minus 1 choose j ways of arranging those j on edges. So we sum over all of those possibilities. And then this is, so this is structural, but here's the contagion part. And then truly structural is, is here. If you go back to this node and look at it, the probability that it has k friends is this modified probability that it has 
uh, K friends if you choose the node itself, right? So it's this thing, this, this thing that makes your friend stranger, have more friends than you. <coughs> Which I think I said, and I haven't written down in this, uh, I mean, I really kind of realized this recently, and there's been some papers on it now, but this is generally true of pretty much any property you can think about people, whether, whether it's wealth or how many chickens they have, there, there, there's going to be something different about your friends. It's, a, it's on average, on average. You take an arbitrary person and look at their friends, whatever property you're measuring about these people, unless it's correlated in a very nice way with degree, the number of friends you have, it's probably going to be off kilter. So it could be that on average, your average person, everyone around them is, is on average less wealthy, for example, or more wealthy. There's going to be this kind of structural imbalance, which, and if it's, if it's in the flip way that on average, everyone is, your, your <coughs> average node, on average, has uh, the people around them are more wealthy, then there's this sort of keeping up with the Joneses thing kind of built into the system in that you, on average, see people who are doing better than you. Right, right. Food. Talk. Um, okay, so this is this nasty looking thing. This is the probability that your edge was not coming from an, a node that was infected. So this is an important thing. This phi sub zero, I know we're jumping back into this. Phi sub zero is the probability that a node was turned on at the start, right? So we have this some sprinkling of edges being uh, nodes being turned on at the start. Um, so they had to be not ignited at the start, and then this is the, ops this is the uh, flip of that, where in fact it was, right? So either there's, you know, it's, it's being switched on, or it was switched on exogenously, right? So this is social, this is exo exogenous. <coughs> All right, lots of words. This turns out to be then a mapping of um, that probably the arbitrary edge is infected at time t to the probability that it's infected at time t plus one. There is some parameter in here, which is phi, I mean, there, there's the whole network structure, but there's phi sub zero, which is the probably that an a, a node is turned on in the first place. All right, <coughs> madness. Okay, so, uh, okay, so what happens, you can, you, this is a thing that I have for you to work on. Just, there's just one little piece to work on for all of this stuff. <coughs> if you take the limit, uh, phi zero goes to zero, right? So it's just you, the chance that you turn on any one node is very, very small. You're getting close to this original case where we just switched on one node, right? We're interested in that. Um, <coughs> okay, and you can show this, you'll get to it, you can show this happens, uh, that you get to this, this function when, when you evaluate at zero, it has to be greater than zero. So this is, a, this is the self-starting story. And I guess I have the picture on the next thing. Let me just say this. Right, so we take the limit, this goes to zero, so here it is. Uh, my words are not coming out well. But basically it means that someone will switch on, you see these are, these are positive numbers, this has to be greater than zero in some way, it means that somewhere in this whole system you have to have some nodes that switch on for free, right? So they have K friends, zero of their friends are on, they switch on. So they just switch on for free. So there's self-ignition in the thing. So you can have that, that makes total sense. That, the, the thing will always start. You don't have to have, so, social effects will carry it from there, but it's got some in, initial stuff. Um, <coughs> then, it's also, then it's possible that this thing will take off. It's an iterative map sort of story. And iterative maps, as long as that, uh, the derivative at zero is greater than zero, then it takes off. That's the story, right? That's the idea. So you, you go back to this horrible thing, essentially take a derivative of it, which looks like fun. Take a derivative, or you make a tail expansion, and you'll get out this <coughs> result, which is exactly what we had before for our simple threshold type model. I know, this is thrilling. Um, this is the, when we looked at the Watts model, this is exactly what we ended up with, right? So there was these three clear parts. This is the probability that you connect to a node of degree k. This is the probability that that node is turned on by one edge being infected. This is the, probably that it's vulnerable. This is this vulnerability condition. And this is the number of new edges that are infected. So this is this growth rate of infected edges. So one edge on average begets this many new edges and if it's greater than one, it takes off. All right, I'm just gonna jump this stuff. But here's the, here's the picture that I kind of want you to see. So this is this iterative map, this is the uh, probably that an edge is switched on at time t plus one, this is probably it's on at time t. And if, the, if this iterative map, that whole mess, which is a binding together of the network structure and the contagion itself, right? And it's a very general kind of story, right? The, and we talked about it with <coughs> getting away from just R naught, right? You have to sort of put all of these pieces in there. Um, 
And of course, this is a model that doesn't have relaxation or quarantine or any of these sorts of things. Okay, so if it has this kind of, and this is the picture I just drew, it will take off from a very small seed. This is an example where you have self-starters. If you start at zero, it takes off. There's a stable point here. And then this is a case, a funny thing about this model, and I, it's written here, a funny thing about this model is that this G function itself depends on the initial fraction that are infected. Phi sub zero is built into its shape. So if you change the initial fraction that are infected, the shape changes. So this is a bit of a subtle thing. Usually with these iterative maps, you can you know, choose any initial condition you want. But actually, if you choose an initial condition, it fixes the map, and then you just have to see, will it take off? So there is a special thing that Gleason and, Co and Carlin worked out, which is that you fix your initial condition, how, you know, what fraction is it, 1%, 2%, whatever it is. That fixes some iterative map for how the thing will then grow. And it could be that it's above an uh, unstable fixed point. So if you've got an initial condition that starts here, then it takes off. If it's at a below, then it decays. So there's a, another kind of level of critical <coughs> mass story in there. All right, I know that's a lot. I know it's a lot, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a thing to work on. I want to tell you more generally about some, so we're going to move away from calculations, and I'll tell you about some results from simulations, which I think are important. They've been floating around for a while in the literature. They're harder to get at. They're harder to, you know, they're not as tractable. Um, this is to show you what happens in, going back to the very simple, well, which we've been talking about, but the very <coughs> simple threshold model. So everyone's got the same threshold. They've all got a fifth in this case, right? So one fifth of their friends turn on, they'll turn on. It's a very basic kind of social contagion model. It's on a random network. And the idea of this is, if you can see this, this is the distribution of, um, so for things that really spread well, right? So you, you start this thing over and over again. Fizzles out, fizzles out, fizzles out. Sometimes it takes off, right? So you, you do run this whole social contagion thing again and again, and then look at the degree of nodes that turn on at time t equals zero, t equals one, t equals two. So we're trying to look at the, uh, the um, early adopters. What are they like for this model? And so, because and there are all sorts of stories about what early adopters are like. You know, they're special in some way. So we're trying to get at how, why these things take off. So it turns out, your, your, your first people, so you're, you're, you're seeding it, you're just seeding with one person. Their distribution of degrees, well, it's a little, you can't see this, but it's a little skewed to the right from the, the underlying degree distribution. So if you've got more friends, it does help with this model. But it's not <coughs> out of control, right? There are some characters down here with three friends or four friends that started a huge spread. At the next time step, it has this shape. I know this is hard to see. It has this shape. I know how to fix this. Um, Um, it has this shape, so, and this should be clear, so there are no nodes, so this is the nodes that turn on at time t equals 1, right? So it's just started. These are your first, they'll, you know, sure. And they have to be vulnerables, right? So it starts at, am I really going to try this thing? All right, I'm brave. <coughs> Oop. Oops, kind of okay, so, um, it, so it starts at t equals 1, and then spreads, potentially, so we're going to switch this one on, right, and it's going to take off, and these edges are all infected, the chance that this one turns on, well, it has to be a vulnerable. Oh, you're not? Wow. Uh, it just, it just totally died. I think it did. Bad thing. Update. <coughs> <laughs> okay. I can't get that thing to work. All right. Okay, so here's the, here's the idea. Thank you. Here's the idea. So we have, we're going to switch this one on exogenously, right? We deploy UG boots. And then the ones that turn on at the next time step, they have to be, if, if they've got lots of friends, right, their threshold is not exceeded, they don't turn on. So it makes complete sense that the very first people that turn on <coughs> have to have uh, a threshold of less than or equal to a fifth. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, the threshold, sorry, everyone has, sorry, everyone, everyone's threshold is a fifth in this, so phi, phi star equals a fifth, this is uniform, 
which means that k is less than or equal to 5, so these are the vulnerables. Okay, okay, right? So, it's only th so these ones are somewhat poorly connected, but it's skewed this way, right? So if someone has one friend, they're turned on straight away, they don't, they're not part of the game. They don't help it spread any further. Someone who has two friends, maybe, but the ones that are doing a really good job are the ones that have exactly five friends. They get infected because they're vulnerables, but they have four other friends they can send it to. So I'm going to call these ones influential vulnerables, right? They're in between. They, they, they're susceptible, they turn on pretty easily, and they get as many other people as possible. This is a totally reasonable thing. So you'll see as time goes on, you get more of these, and then you start at time t equals 4 and 5, you start to see ones that take two hits, right? So they start to appear. So you start to see some of these less vulnerable ones appearing. So that bump is there. But all along, it's kind of raging through these <laughs> nodes that have five friends. They're really successful uh, or, or, you know, very helpful. And then that starts to build up. You, start, you see these two hit guys. And then there are some that take three, three. And then it starts to look much more like the underlying, eventually, the underlying distribution of, of degree. So it's a reasonable thing. So point being, yeah, so this sort of illustrates, I mean, it's clear, we can explain it, illustrates that, yeah, you need these somewhat gullible characters to help you, right? They, people with one friend, that's no good, right, obviously, or, or who influence no one else. You know, they could have a thousand friends, but they influence no one else in this particular category of stuff. All right. Okay, so a couple other things you can do. This is a funny business. Uh, you can look at, in this case, what we did was we took average, we just looked at average, so we've got some degree distribution, <coughs> take the average uh, degree and look at how they, those characters do, if you see them. They're the ones you start with. So we're going to show you something funny here. And then these ones are the top 10%. So you take the top 10%, right? They've got the most friends. And start with them. And see how much better they do than the average one. How much do... Because you see things like the 1 in 10 people control what everyone else does. I mean, there are, there are these kind of books that have these and ideas that come out of management schools all over the place, you know, that, that, that this, is, this is how it works. All right. All right, so, it, so it's sort of a toy version of that. So this is the final, or the average size spread. And what you see is it doesn't really matter too much, <coughs> right? So the ones that have, they're in this top 10% do a little better. And this, the reason for this is the initial character does not usually matter. It's the structure of the network, right? And the conditions that I've been showing you are all about the whole network. It's not about who has the most friends, right? This, um, you know, this thing, for example, the sum of k p k over the average degree, right? This guy, k minus one. If I haven't said this properly, this guy. This condition. And this is about everything in the network is in here. The whole distribution, <coughs> the properties of the contagion, everything is in there. <coughs> Whether it spreads or not is all about that, right? So it's, in, and you can think, the, the natural example, and I've used a lot, is, is a forest fire, right? So you've got a forest. Yeah, you go and you, you walk in there with a match and you say, this is, you know, and you, and you think, oh, and you light it up and the whole thing spreads and then we think the match is the, the important thing. But if it was raining, it doesn't matter, right? So it, it's a property of the forest as a whole that's connected enough. And, and so it makes a lot of sense. When we, when we think about fire, it's totally fine. But we kind of make a mistake when we come to people. We think the match is important. Um, we put it in the front of our famous book. Okay, so then you can take, you can do something like you can say, okay, let's take the <coughs> ratio of their degrees. So these influentials, or these ones that have more friends, what's the ratio of their degrees? And then we'll take the ratio of their final size of the spread from each one. And so this is the degree ratio, and this is one here. So yes, uh, the ones, the, that's, that's the structure of this, right? We're saying, we're taking the top 10% in terms of degree, which is a local property, versus the, the average degree ones. Take their ratio. They have more friends, this is sort of two. So on average for this little system, they have twice as many friends. This is the ratio of the, um, uh, the final size, sorry. This is the cascade size ratio, right? So at these ends where there's not much taking off anyway, things don't really take off, although it's pretty dangerous at this end, uh, they, they, they uh, bank up a little bit. But you see in the middle here, they're basically getting you the same final size, right? So the same final size spread. There's not much difference. It gets a little uh, messy down here when the numbers are very small. So then the gain is, what's the, what's the gain, this gain ratio? 
or this gain is a ratio of ratios, which is kind of ridiculous, but if you double the degree of your initial node, the one that you're going to set fire to, um, figuratively, I hope, uh, what's the gain in the average spread? You know, do you double your average, the average size? Like, what's your return for doing that? And so most of the time, it's less than one. Right? So if this, it depends how much it costs to influence people, but this is something that marketers and people who are actually trying to do good things worry about all the time when you're trying to spread something. So it's not so great. Um, this is another one where you, it's a scale-free kind of situation, and so you get a little, it does a little better, right, if you start off with someone who's more um, uh, influential, meaning they have more friends. Uh, but then you still get the same kind of property. So these gray bars indicate where you get a gain of greater than one. All right, <coughs> all right, right? Doubling, say, let's say doubling your, the average, uh, the degree of the initial guy more than doubles your um, final, your expected final size of spread. So you get a return in that sense. <coughs> now you can, uh, this is just a few other things here, you can create networks where uh, things spread from just one person, right? So these are, we talked about the vulnerables and all sorts of things. Moving away from random networks, you can, you can easily make things that spread in very crazy ways, right? So these are these very contrived ladder networks where I'm going to switch this one on. These characters all have, well, these ones have three friends. So they'll switch on. It's a threshold of a third. These ones have four. So they'll instantly see two of their friends are on. So they'll, they'll switch, they'll switch, they'll switch. So you can, so this, this story we had about a vulnerable component breaks down when you start to look at more structured networks. Okay, so that's an important observation. It's an another example. It's kind of a ramified network, which I'll show you again. Uh, but you take, may, may take a random network and then sort of, you know, replace nodes by groups of nodes. <coughs> All right, so let's do that. A few harmless flakes working together can unleash an avalanche of destruction. All right, good. Groups. So groups, very important things. We love them. They're all over the place. Um, and I'll, you know, this will connect to some other things. So when we look at the original model, which is a toy model, and we want to sort of maybe generalize and get some more results. So for instance, this vulnerable story, right? Just as I've said, it seems to not keep generalizing. It's a very big, it's a nice departure. It's a very important departure from the mean field version. But suddenly we've <coughs> got this, um, this uh, you know, possibility of groups and what will happen there. All right, so uh, degree distribution, this is a good thing. Uh, sparse interactions, very reasonable. These are pieces that you know, were part of the original model. Random networks don't represent real networks very well, as we've said. In fact, not at all. Pure random networks, certainly. And also random networks in general. They don't have local structure. They don't have uh, clustering. And it's easy to make uh, you know, big claims when you're not even looking at something that's real. So we can put in group structure fairly readily. Uh, we've looked at this, and I'll show you these pictures again, these bipartite affiliation graphs. We can construct uh, toy models that have groups in them. So this paper, which itself is doing pretty well, uh, has a couple of pieces in it. Um, yeah, and these are just words. I'm just going to tell you. We don't have to. I just want to give you these, these ideas. So one possibility is to say, all right, let's take a random network. So these are, right, and then replace all of the nodes in that random network with groups. And so, for instance, we put 10 nodes in each group. So it's been kind of ramified. And then we'll have a probability P of edges being placed between <coughs> these 10 nodes, and they're probably a queue of them being added across the original links, right? So we take away these group links, if you like, but they're still in the background. They're not real links anymore. They're just um, suggestive links between the groups. But every pair uh, in these linked groups gets a, a probably a queue of, of connecting. So we're going to build this kind of group-based thing. So it's going to have lots of structure. Right? And it's hard. I mean, we try to work on this. Analytically, yes, you could play around with this, but you certainly do well with a simulation. The idea is, yes, you, 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 you seed this here, or you seed a whole group, potentially, which is a very reasonable thing to do. Everyone gets a pair of Ugg boots here. <coughs> and then, because they have strong ties across groups, there could be two, three, four links from here to one person, right? So their thresholds can be exceeded. So now we can get, a potentially, a very different outcome. You've seen this before, and I'll just say it again. So bipartite networks giving rights, right? So we have context and individuals giving rise to groups. Um, and then we can think of the context having structure, and then we can think of having different kinds of contexts, and we can realize networks <coughs> from this. So this is a generalized affiliation networks, um, and we have this probability of people being 
connected based on how far apart they are in uh, hierarchies, just to be quick here. Um, so this has two extra pieces we added to this, which is insane. Uh, but there's an intergroup probability of, so you build your network and then you add some more socialness to it. So if you're within a group, there's some probability that you become friends with more people in that group. And then there's a probability that you become friends with people across those groups, you know, extra ones on top. So we, we're just sort of evolving at one step, which is a very natural social thing. Okay, so <coughs> upshot is this. Uh, these are random networks versus group <coughs> networks. So here are the... Um, yeah, so this is this generalized affiliation model going across here. This is this uh, random network, right? We have these two kinds of weird ways of making networks that have groups in them. This red outline is what happens with your pure random network that we had before. This is where cascades could take off. This is the th threshold that everyone has across here. This is the average degree of everyone, right? So one of these points in here is a network with a particular spreading mechanism on top. Right. This tells you which random network it is, or the average degree of the network. This tells you what everyone's threshold is. So you see that, and so this gray is showing you where things spread, and what happens is, as you move across from a single seed, you get kind of similar, it's a bit different, but you get sort of similar overlap here. A random seed, so now you're going to randomly turn 10 on, because we have groups of size 10, randomly turn 10 on, that opens things up. But if you switch a group on, then this cascade window opens up, Usually, right? So this is just what, you know, we've got a toy model, we move away from it in one direction, we're going to add groups, which is sort of a hard thing to do, but it completely transforms or opens up the possibility of really huge spreading, right? So this is a, these are networks that don't have any vulnerable components anymore. They don't have that structure anymore. But they're connected in such ways that things can go So you can't see it. It's very hard to see that this, this is something that's going to be vulnerable to use a well, again, but at the larger, at the larger scale, two, uh, two cascades. All right. It's a big deal. It does have all sorts of suggestions, you know, like you, you know, for doing good things, try to turn on groups, right? Or maybe move groups between places instead of exchanging one person, you know, if you're trying to do something like a, um, <coughs> you know, educational exchange and so on, maybe move groups and so on. Yeah, there's all sorts of things that kind of come out of it. Uh, one odd thing, I showed you these multiplier things before. So here's a strange one. Here's, a, here's one of these random groups, and here's the gain. So this is saying that uh, for high degree networks, <coughs> this is pretty bananas, for high degree networks, the top 10% nodes do worse, they actually do worse than your average ones. Average ones will lead to, on average, a bigger spread which is kind of, so this is really strange, right? This is not what you would think. You would think, if you've got more money, influence the more influential people. But you can actually have struct network structures, quite reasonable ones, where this is not true. And so here's the example. This is the underlying degree distribution. This is from one of these random networks, these random group networks. This is the average cascade size. If you start at, here's a degree 10 node, a degree 15 node. So you see that's actually, there's merit to finding these Starting, not just, it's not just the initial ones that take off, it's the person you start with, they're not well connected. And so the reason is assortativity, which we've talked about, um, degree assortativity. So you can certainly have networks where if you seed one person, you need people around them that are susceptible, and then it can spread from there and spread from there and spread from there. If you have networks where well-connected nodes are connected to other well-connected nodes, they're going to be resilient to this threshold kind of spreading. Things are not going to take off if you start with one of them. Um, so this is, this is really quite surprising, right? So this, this, this sort of throws the whole thing um, open because you may certainly need to go out and just get your real... It's not just... Okay. So it's not just that the thing spreads through the network through average people, which is the, that story of the early adopters. Average people are spreading the thing. That's, you know, and, and it's a, because it's away from you, the initial person, or the advertising campaign, or whatever it is, it's away from you. You know, you tell, some, you tell a bunch of people, then they start to tell other people, and they start to tell other people. You have no idea about this. This is the social wild, right? You don't know what's going on out there. I mean, we do, you know, Facebook tries to do it, and everyone tries to do it with social media. That's a new, very new thing, certainly. And 
success of that, I guess, is still to be seen. But um, <coughs> it's certainly annoying, but uh, the success there. But the, you can't really see. You generally, generally, you can't really see it, and you shouldn't actually be out there, right? You should be let, if your thing is good, you want average people to truly spread it between themselves. So this is how to become famous. Um, and uh, so this is an extra part which says in some cases it may be that your, you know, your initial targets, the people you want to influence to start with, you know, it's not Oprah. You don't really go for Oprah. You may have, depending on the thing that's spreading and the, and the mechanism, it may be better to get average people involved, right? Okay, so <coughs> this is one summary. I'll, I'll kind of put together this contagious stories thing separately, I think. So influential vulnerables, that's what I'll call them, key to the spreading. Early adopters are mostly of, of this kind, there are these vulnerable characters who are influential. Certainly you can move, you, we get this big observation when we go to networks to start with random networks, which is where you have to start, that vulnerables are this key. Like you say, okay, now we need to know where all the vulnerables are, and that's where we'll start the thing. So you're a marketer, you go out and find your vulnerables. You know, you tell your, your team, it's all about vulnerables, right? But then, you know, we move away from that just a little more, we add some groups, <coughs> and that story disappears. Now that, you know, groups become kind of a thing, very much harder to analyze and, and so on, but, that, you know, I think that's, that's sort of the story. Uh, even, we know for the simple models that the, <coughs> the cascade condition, this thing is a, you know, has global data going into it, right? It's a global thing, it's about the whole system. Uh, that's probably still true for all of these other ones. It's just hard to, you know, we can't write it down necessarily. Um, we did have this result early on for the random networks that you can get extreme, surprising, terrible or good results, depending on what you, what you want, uh, for these well-connected networks that don't look like things are going to spread on. Um, right, and influentials are stuff that we, that we come up with them later on, <coughs> right? We go and find where it started from and we think that's the key. Um, okay, so if you want to spread things, you get to the influential vulnerables, well, you don't get to them. <coughs> you, you, you actually work on making things spread, you know, making things that people will spread genuinely between themselves, which sounds horrible. You actually work on the product. Um, and, and I think there is this piece too, that simple ideas spread well, right? So that's a kind of a battle you have, that simple things are going to spread. You need, you need a, probably a hierarchy of stuff uh, associated with the thing you're spreading uh, so that the simple piece can get out there and then people can start adding more and more and more. Belief systems work quite well in this way. Um, and you certainly need this. You need some property of the thing that people are adopting, that they're taking on, that will, for whatever reason, make them adopt it. I mean, fashion, there it is. Um, you know, the thing is so exciting, they have to talk about it. You know, they have to show each other. Whatever it is, um, I mean, they're the things that's, that, that do well. So passive versus active. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, combining with other things. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so I have a little video. So let me, I'll show you this video. So I want to, um, that's it for social connect. I'm going to talk about fame, so that's something that, that, that will connect all uh, back to this. All right, so, wow. Um, <laughs> so, all right, the next round, there are three rounds. So the next round, now we're collectively going to try and do a good job, right? You've already done a good job, but let's see if we can do a good job collectively <coughs> such that the average score of ours, uh, you know, everyone's score is, is as close as possible. So your incentive now is to look at what other people have done. Well, the game is to look at what other people have done, try to use the knowledge of the humans around you, and uh, yeah, yeah. There's no winning personally anymore, right? This is a team effort. Unless so you really believe you're right, you keep your numbers, right? <laughs> Which I know some people will do, because that's their, their nature. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah. Just collude through the information on the uh, piece of paper. So if it's a new column? No, no like no calculators. What's that? Just in the new column. In the new column, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just have to write down one number per page. Stupid thing. All right. <coughs> All right, that's what we're doing. Uh, what else? I'm going to tell you a few other things. <coughs> okay, so I finally, I had some trouble with this camera. I know it's an absurd thing that I do, but um, just for fun, I, uh, where, where they died, I put in random footage from things. So, for example, this is climbing up 
the haiku stairs in Hawaii, which is the most terrifying thing <laughs> I've done <laughs> for a long time. Um, <coughs> there's, no, there's no voice or anything, but it would probably be me whimpering and crying. Basically, it's just going straight up this ridge, which has thousands of feet of drop on either side. And uh, it was made in the, it was, it was wood to start with, I think made in the 30s, 940s, and there's radar, there were all this radar equipment at the top. It's all very old. So there's all this stuff in, in Hawaii with volcanoes where you, they drag crazy things up, <coughs> made these um, volcano, you know, these uh, radar setups. Uh, what's that? No. <laughs> and I hate heights. I really do. I'm a f I grew up in the flatlands. Um, <coughs> this was just. It's, it, it doesn't do it justice. I mean, this just this is unreal. A guy died on this lot the week before. I mean, it's it's also illegal. You're not supposed to go there. Yeah. Um, maybe you can see from this. This is Oahu. So that's a highway down there. That's uh, yeah, yeah, and it just goes. <laughs> oh my god, oh my god. Anyway, that was bananas. I don't know why I did that. <coughs> and. The other one is some other, what else? Oh yeah, this is riding up a, this is a really good uh, bike ride, Tantalus, it's at the back of Honolulu. Good, good, uh, good climbing there. Anyway, so everything's up now, blah, 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 all those things. Uh, tweetage, this is a fun thing. All right, so we have, um, so Danforth put this together. This is uh, a little study of uh, Seinfeld. So we've got all the scripts from Seinfeld and did our little happiness thing on it. So this is, you know, some text. This is from the one where he, um, he's trying to take a severed toe. This is Kramer to the hospital. And a mugger tries to take over the bus. Anyway, Kramer ends up driving the bus while fighting the, the mugger. <laughs> it's a ridiculous story. <laughs> I'm driving the bus! And then, you know, anyway, so the thing is, uh, you know, who's the happiest character? It turns out it's Kramer, at least in terms of our little thing here. This is Kramer compared to Jerry, so you can play around with this. So Kramer says all these words more than Jerry, and they're all positive words. He says these negative words less, like not and don't and bad and so on. These are ones going against him. He doesn't say these words as much. They're positive words. Um, but the major yeah, yeah. So you can, you can play around with that. These are seasons. It turns out that the supporting cast matters because they kind of elevate the whole thing. Anyway, that's kind of ridiculous. Tweets for you. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. This one didn't work, but it's great. This is the hand feeding of a platypus. It's totally great. You should look at this later on. Like, you can kind of scratch its tummy like a, a dog. I've never seen that. Um, okay. <coughs> They're very shy things. Okay, that's good. That's good. And then we, I think. Should I start on this? Okay. Let's see how we do with this. All right, so this is going to be, mm, mm. you know what, I, I'll, I'll come back. I'm going to start on scaling. All right, let's do that. These guys can wait. Is there anything else? Mm. Oh, well that food can be passed around. I guess you have to throw nuts and things. Yeah? We're okay. There's nuts in here. That's bad for you, though, right? <coughs> okay, humans. All right. Um, <coughs> all right. So, okay. So we'll talk about scaling. This is fantastic, right? Scaling is... We've, we've done the whole power wall size distribution. <coughs> you are sick of them. But the statistics of surprise. That's a whole business, right? That's everywhere. So, but scaling is another thing uh, that's got power walls in it. It's a different behavior. So I am going to uh, give you a whole bunch of examples. I'm going to talk about this thing called a lot, which is termed as allometry, which some of you will know about. And people have different as affine scaling was sort of a ridiculous thing that people who like fractals would say. Uh, allometry is sort of spread out from biology and ecology uh, to become a term that people will use in a lot of different fields. So you talk about allometry within cities, for example. So it's a it's a thing. So to be compared with isometry, uh, this will be uh, you know, a big story about supply networks. Energy metabolism, all sorts of things here. Uh, it would be kind of a CSI investigation. All right. 
Okay, so lots of things have lots of big systems, lots of systems where there are systems of different sizes, and we can be talking about animals, that includes the platypus, of course, but um, you know, for mammals we have shrews to elephants running around. I mean, they're very a huge range of scales for life. And then you can keep going down to the little things, down to mitochondria, right? Little energy units. Where they are. Um, massive, massive scale. So we'll we'll have some, I'll look at we'll look at some scales, some of the variation in scale <coughs> for life in particular, but um, yeah, so we have lots of things. There's also temporal scales as well, so that's a that's another piece here. Uh, but a lot of it's about shapes. It'll be about shapes. Um, so we're going to have some definitions, some examples, and how to measure things. There are there's sort of a, a ubiquitous a way that actually everyone is being forced to use now. So I have to mention that. Um, but there are other ways. It, again, much like uh, parallel <coughs> size distributions, nasty business, right? It's these measurements. <coughs> parallel size distribution, you have, a, you have a decay. Often now we're going to be talking about things that grow with each other. Right? So like the, the height and width of trees, for example, the height and width of buildings, or how bridges scale, or engines scale. Um, all sorts of possibilities. Okay, allometry theory aside, someone killed a theory. All right, so uh, we've had this expression before, but now we'll, we'll manifestly put a positive thing here. It's not always going to be true, but generally we'll be thinking <coughs> about that. So we have a scaling exponent, the same words are there. We have a prefactor again, same thing. It's not a probability distribution anymore, it's just a relationship. Just a relationship. Uh, you need to have that prefactor actually has, it's not just a little random constant, it has some... Uh, Units in it, which is, can make things a little bit tricky. It's always nice to, um, you know, make make equations non-dimensional, but it does have dimension. So, for instance, if you have something where the length of something <laughs> is scaling as volume to a quarter, there's some, you know, so this word allometry, allometric scaling there, uh, instead of volume to a third, which would be the simple things. Uh, then, you know, this prefactor is carrying around a, a length scale inside it. Just, just a side note. Parallel relationships, yes, uh, end up as log log uh, plot um, happiness. <coughs> so, same sort of thing. Log base 10 is usually where we are. And right, we can do some regression on that. People argue about this, get very excited. Right. We're, but we're certainly away from whether it's, a pa whether it's a parallel decay or a log normal or a stretch. That's not what we're doing anymore, right? That's, that was about probability distributions. This is a relationship. Okay. Uh, so lots of rummaging around trying to find if you've got a straight line on a log log plot. Um, we're going to use base 10 because we're good people. And we talk about orders of magnitude, right? This is a long, this has been around <coughs> for a long time. Something to do with engineers, maybe the metrics is the French. Or the, it's usually the Belgian, right? Actually, it's like Australia, it's always New Zealanders. Like the famous Australians are usually always New Zealanders. And, um, you know, French fries, Belgian. Mm -hmm. Freedom fries, I should say. Excuse me. What's that? What's that? Also waffles. What's that? Wow, that's that's rough. Yeah, that really hurts. <laughs> that's really hurts. Yeah. Just thank you very much. We'll put our name in front of it. Yeah. <laughs> also the Canadians. Very sneaky here. Yeah. A lot of funny people are Canadians. Anyway. They are. They are. They just don't talk. Anyway, yeah, right. You had a question? Yeah. Or just an abuse? Mm -hmm. For fun and enjoyment. Right. So I'm going to say, yeah, right. So ultimately you have to sort of say, all right, look, here it is. It's not bad. And now I have a mechanism that explains why it is that. And then we'll fight about that. That's when you, you know, that's when you get the job done. <coughs> but I'll give you, so here's one, here's, here's what I'll call it. Yeah, it's a heartwarming example, right? This is, this is one that makes you feel good. You've seen it in a paper maybe cry a little bit. You know, like it's really, it's an emotional experience when this happens because people try to sneak the little, look at this, many orders of magnitude. Even this is fraught with some problems, but there are five orders of magnitude, six really probably, and then similar here. And this is super cool. Actually, this, the, this, is, this is appearing pretty well. So, so this, is, this I'm going to hold up as a great example. And I, I have it on the next slide, but basically it's really good to have three orders of magnitude in either direction, at least. That's just rule of thumb, but it, you know, if you show that to someone else, there's some chance they'll believe you, right? 
That's what, yeah. And then they'll say, well, why? And then you're like, oh. That's, yeah. Okay, so let's look at this one, because this is great. This is, this, is, this is a good thing. So we had um, Sanofsky speak here a couple of years ago. I should put a link to his talk. Super interesting guy. Very famous guy. Um, okay, so <coughs> lots of bad things happened to animals that went into this, okay, including some humans. Uh, volume of gray matter and volume of white matter in the scone, in the thinky bit, right? With the, so this general idea that the gray stuff is the computational units and the white stuff is the wiring, roughly speaking. Okay. Um, and there's this observation, if you do your regression here, that uh, it's you know, plus or minus some error, but the white matter volume scales as gray matter volume to 1.23. So it's superlinear scaling. And the sort of thing we have is sublinear, linear, superlinear. Superlinear scaling, so <coughs> it's, it's going up. If we put it on a you know, normal linear thing, it's going to be not super fast, right? But it is going like so. So the bigger your brain is, the more wiring comes into play. And so there'll be a little argument for why this is so. It's a little, little bit sneaky, but we'll see what you think about it. Um, pretty great. Our, uh, you know, 0.998, uh, it's not a bad correlation story here. Uh, so we've got elephant, pilot whale, the human. So the hum human is not off the chart here, right? This is, a, this is a something about the structure of brains that we don't, you know, we walk around saying we've got big brains, haha, -ha, we're smarter than you, other organisms, um, <coughs> who secretly are going to beat us one day. But, um, you know, we sort of have outsized brains, perhaps, most of us. And then, um, <coughs> Uh, but we don't, architecturally, it's, we're not off the scale, right? We, we're still within the same, like, it's a computing thing. Yeah. All right. Okay, so humans, we've got a lot of things in here that, that went through laboratories. Horses in here, the long-eared desert hedgehog um, shrews, just a few grams for shrews. They can be pretty small little characters, but it's all mammals. Obviously, mouse and rat have just been floating around and just get called mouse and rat and rabbit. Everyone else gets, like, you know, here's a, Tufted ear marmoset. Wow, this is uh, the eye eye. That's always good. Um, the woolly monkey. Anyway, all right, so, okay, so you can enjoy that uh, later on. But um, yeah, lots of things on here. Flying fox. Oh dear. Maybe it crashed into a tree. Um, okay, the large Madagascar hedgehog. Yes. How can mammals I mean, bullets? mammals, animals are just hilarious. What's that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, that's a good question, yeah. I'm not sure if, uh, so a lot of work goes into doing this. So I, I don't, I don't <coughs> know if that's been done. I will show you some things for birds versus mammals later on. I mean, one of the things is the birds run at a slightly higher core temperature. They're, so there's a bit of a different game there for them. Um, I don't know, I don't know if their brains are architecturally different. Uh, you know, in some ways you kind of expect not, given the way that, I mean, one, just as a guess, hypothesis, uh, that, you know, humans sort of fit in here as well. All right. Okay, so why is this? Why is there this scaling? And so here's a, here's a little argument for it. So we'll have to define a few things. So we've got this, uh, the processing structure. We've got gray matter, uh, white matter. So we'll call them GW. So this is volume. Cortical thickness, right? So you've got, a, you've got your, wrap, your little your brain, which hopefully has lots of corrugations. Apparently that's a good thing. Um, uh, cortical surface area, so it's corrugated, but it has some surface area. <laughs> There's the average length of these wires. This is, you know, this is using the argument from the, from the paper. And then there's some density of the, these axons as they hit the cortical thickness. <sighs> wow, actually stand up today. All right, <coughs> right, so you've got your nice it's got some thickness in here, which is uh, T. And there's some surface area if we unwrap our brain, <coughs> make it into a piece of tofu. And we've got surface area S, and then a thickness T this way. Thinking tofu. Thinking meat, have you read that? That is really great. Oh my god, I have to get that one. Yeah. <coughs> it's a short story. I'll find that for you. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Really a great short story. Basically, alien race, are, you know, kind of finding out what's going on in the universe, mapping it out, comes to Earth from a distance, 
And there's an argument between the captain and the first mate about whether the things they found on Earth, on this planet, are really made out of meat. Like, just meat. You know, they, surely they have some, you know, cyborg structure in them, but they can't understand it. Like, the meat thinks. What does it think? And the guy's like, meat. I'm telling you it's meat. Um, <laughs> and then they pretend it never happened. They just leave. Um, <coughs> okay. So, uh, how do they communicate? They flap their meat. <laughs> They're disgusted. All right, so, uh, very funny. Um, <coughs> I think it won some awards. All right, let's see. So let's, uh, so let's do some rough, uh, oh yeah, yeah. And so we've got our piece of tofu over here. And then if we, we have a little piece in here and there's, a, there's all these wires coming out of it and there's some density of wires. Okay. P, that's the P. Okay, so roughly, here's, here's the rough argument. This is very nasty physics kind of back of the envelope, very small envelope. Back of a stamp. So, uh, all right, so the gray matter, S times T. Yeah, there's some convolutions, but it's not crazily fractal or anything. So uh, the volume of that is your slab of tofu, right? It's been unwrapped. We've got um, uh, S times T, okay? Uh, then the wiring, <coughs> we're going to think of it somewhat like this. So the wiring, so let's imagine our brain is here. Here's our, it's wrapped around, obviously. <laughs> This is completely insane. Uh, we've got all these wires between things. A little bit of thinking, communicating. And uh, so this surface area S here, this is you know, sort of in this ball. So we've got surface area times the length of these guys and times P, this gives you, this gives you the total number of them. This is the number of axons. But they have two ends, so we have to divide it by a half because we've counted them. They connect back into our piece of tofu. Um, there's this times the length of them, and, this, and there's some sort of width of them. This will be proportional to the white matter volume. <laughs> All right. And, you know, so, there's some so this is assuming there's some characteristic width of axons that is universal, actually. It doesn't, it's always little sneaky things. Like the whale's axons are as thick as shrew axons. Um, <coughs> whales are not on here right now, but hard things to pin down. Um, <coughs> and, and when we'll talk about metabolism, and whales are just a different business altogether with the whole blubber thing. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, and the sheep. Okay, so let's see. So uh, there's this statement here, so that, you know, again, it's sort of assuming this ball, right? So there's our little shrew character over here, tiny brain. And then, I don't know, maybe we're at a sheep, and then there's a big brain over here. Um, that the scaling, how this scales is the, um, this is a bit of an important thing, that this G, right, we've got wriggles, that this overall G is proportional to L cubed, as in 4 thirds pi r squared, pi r cubed, this sort of thing, right? Volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed, that kind of nonsense, all right? Maybe. So we're doing something. So you see that there's a surface area here and a length here for, for, for uh, the width, for, sorry, for the white matter, for, uh, and an L cubed here for the gray matter. <coughs> I can't, I want to spend it because it's just a great thing. And it, do, it does, I mean, it, I mean, your question is an outstanding one, right? but it really does kind of give you a great example. Lots of fantastic scaling, looks really good. Here's a little argument, which you, you know, maybe not quite right, but. Um, it's the right game, yeah. So we're going to eliminate, so we've got these three equations we claim. This one, I think, is sort of a bit of a funny one. Uh, so we can eliminate S from these two to get that the white matter volume scales as gray matter volume to the four-thirds. Can we do that? I've got this one, so this is equation one, this is equation two, and I haven't written it down. Yeah, and G is proportional to S times T. So if we take these two guys, um, so this is, this gives us S is proportional to G divided by T. We're going to do all sorts of bad things. Um, okay, so we're going to have white matter proportional to, we can get rid of the half, that doesn't matter. There's a P. Am I going to get rid of the P? Yeah, but the P is just a constant. All right, that's bad. Also bad. Uh, we're going to replace this S by G divided by T. That's S, and that L, we're going to replace by G to a third. 
Right? This is L, this is S, and there's something we're saying that P is a universal thing across all organisms as well, so you can see, you can come back and worry about all these things later on. <laughs> but this is a mad thing where, we, where we've got our piece of paper out. So there's this, so that's kind of getting there, right? So white matter, the, the observation from the data was 1.23. <coughs> 1 so this is G to the 1.33. And so this cortical thickness, if that's growing with organisms, so you've got a thicker cortex as you go up from shrews to just a little bit, which seems to be the observation, then, um, and here it is. So we've got to this. If there's, this is an observed, so this is not explained. So here's a problem. This isn't explained. But there's a weak scaling. 0.1 is horrifically small. It's logarithmic, maybe, who knows. But basically, cortical thickness does seem to increase. It's plausible it's a power law scaling, maybe. Maybe it's a logarithmic thing. Um, so convolutions fill space. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, then, you, you know, this little argument gets you close to the... I mean, it gets you right to the observed thing. Now, of course, we've observed something. We can, yeah. What number do you want, right? <laughs> Which is sort of the province of various fields. Okay. Um, you know, but this is, this is an observation. So there's a, there's a piece in there that's like, okay, we've got another observed bit. We're going to stick it in here. This needs to be explained. I don't know. It's like computational units. Like, how do they, how do they grow for some reason? You can have a thicker thing inside a elephant for some reason. You, you're, you're putting your data banks in or whatever it is. Your CPUs can grow. I don't know what's going on. And it's all mushy tofu biology stuff too, right? There, w there is physics involved, of course. This stuff has to communicate with itself. And yeah. Uh, okay. All right. There are some complications. So this is a bit of a complication because if you look at this, this is total volume. So it's gray matter plus white matter. That seems to scale really well with white matter and gray matter as well. Like, you know, so here's a bit of a problem. Right? The, you can make, you can, you can do these sorts of things and then they're sort of, one, one of them must be an approximation. But they both look great. You just showed someone this one, you're like, yeah, sure, that's a fantastic power law. But these two can't quite be, they can't all be power laws. Is what I'm saying. All right. But they were honest. This is from the paper. So like, eh. Okay. So measuring exponents is, is uh, a bit of a mess. But not, not a bad effort here. This is what the, you know, not a bad effort. I mean, the data is a fantastic. It's a fantastic data set. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is rules of thumb. I'm going to give it to you. Uh, I think I first heard of these from Jens Feder, who uh, is a famous kind of fractals guy, who's a, a professor at Oslo, in Oslo, and looks fantastically like Santa Claus. Yeah, so lives in the snow. All right. So three orders of magnitude in each variable. Then you're like, yes, I'm a champion. This is great. My power law is a power law. Yours is not. Um, uh, medium quality, if one of them is doing that, and you've got, you know, because that, that could be the case. You've got a lot of range here for something you can measure well, the other thing doesn't. Yeah. And then it starts to get dubious, you know, when you've got less than one order of magnitude. People try to sell you these things. They just <coughs> sneak it into the paper, it's in there, it's like figure four, no one's watching. Do not buy things from those people. Do not cite them, is what we're saying. Okay, so general rules of thumb. This is all very well and good until you come up with your mechanism. So. You know, it's, it's, um, and, and fractals kind of have this business as well. Like, that's a terrific fractal, but why? Mathematicians don't care, actually. It's pretty. Uh, so here's a bit of a funny <coughs> one. And this guy's a good guy. I'm going to meet him in Japan, actually, in a couple of weeks. But uh, really good guy. But uh, this is, you know, this is what... And, uh, I have some other examples from city scaling. This is a bit questionable. It's a... Uh, it's a walking speed, measured walking speed of people in cities, right? So, first of all, you get your humans out, and they watch your graduate students, and they watch people walking, and they time them. And if someone's watching very carefully, they're like, what are you, why, what are you doing? They get arrested. Um, so, there's this cl claim, and I think this is natural log, so that's, a, that's bad, that's bad. Because um, it looks like you've got many orders of magnitude, magnitude here, but, right, that's... That's a little shaky. Can't do that. Slap, slap. So this is more like three orders of magnitude, probably. Uh, and there's this very weak growth here, right? This is 1.2 on an exponential scale. 
I mean, it does seem to be going up. But whether it's really a power law growth, anything where you've got a scaling that's down to close to zero could be logarithmic, maybe, or some other, you know, you could plausibly come up with something else. Uh, and I think it is a bit more complicated. I think there are just, you know, it's somewhat cultural. I mean, it's definitely a cultural thing. There are some places that aren't so big where everyone walks around really fast. Uh, you could get, there's cadence too. Cadence, with, like speaking cadence is an interesting thing. So um, certainly going from the country to the city, things can dial up. Anyway, all right. <coughs> that was an anecdote, so that's not good. All right, so, so power, there, there's some scale invariance in the system. That's what's going on, right? There's something that, that there isn't, these objects can be reshaped so that they look like each other. We can deform a mouse into an elephant. All right. Um, and uh, I guess I'm, <coughs> um, yeah. Well, I'll mention that later. Okay, all right. So it could be objects, right? So it could be shapes of things, you know, legs and arms and trunks and things. Uh, but it could be, so this is, you know, this is the province of the five tools get very excited. Could be time series. You reshape time series and they look the same. People like to do this in all sorts of things. There's heartbeats, finance, all sorts of things where you rescale. Um, <coughs> sometimes in music. Uh, there could be some sort of functional relationships, distributions. So it could be, and, and in many cases, statistically the same. It looks, you know, looks similar. Right, and famously, that's why, you know, you have to put a hammer next to something. If you take, if you take a picture of a natural <coughs> thing, particularly in geology, you have to put a hammer there or a human because no one has any idea what scale it is. Otherwise. Um, okay, so, and a good thing to do is rescale and you can show how, uh, how things match up. So here's a little... A little example of just how this works. It's just, just the right words. Rescaling. All right. So we're going to rescale x um, uh, with with some r times some other measure, right? So we're going to you know go from foot uh, feet to cubits or something, whatever it is, right? We're going to dive back into some good old stuff. Um, furlongs. Okay. And then we have uh, that's another good one. Furlongs, not bad. Okay. So. Um, uh, yeah, so then we're going to scale y in some way, and we'll, we'll put a power in here, and we'll show that it works, right? So this is fine. So um, we've rescaled y, or we've replaced y with r alpha to the y prime, and we've re replaced x with rx r to the x prime. Things will work if we can cancel everything out, and so that's true. r to the alpha we're going to put over here. This r to the alpha comes off here, and so these guys um, disappear. So we get the same relationship, right? We can rescale this thing differently, and this is the idea of volumetry, right? We're not rescaling x by r and y by r. If we did that, that's isometry, right? That means everything looks the same. Okay, okay you can't do it with most, with all these other functions, and you can have some fun thinking about this mathematically, but uh, you, can't, you can't extrude the lambda here, or sorry, the r out of the exponential. It's stuck. <coughs> you can't, can't pull it out, right? So that's, you're in trouble. So you can't get back to the original shape. This is a very pervasive kind of thing. So scale matters there. All right, we're just going to ignore that. Okay, allometry. All right. Isometry. This is not actually how trees did this, but isometry. We rescale and we get the, it's the same shape, right? So we can just change our um, image, like dialing it in every direction, and we'll get the same object. Uh, but if you have to start scaling, uh, you know, sh changing the width and the length at different rates <coughs> in a particular kind of parallel way, then you, you're into what we'll call, uh, so there's a nonlinear rescaling, and this is allometry, right? So we're going to call it allometry. Um, the original meaning comes from differential growth of uh, different parts of, of uh, biological organisms. That's the original meaning. And it's actually, so there was some effort to, as I said before, allometry's gone beyond biology, but this, there was an effort to kind of put it together uh, in biology. People were using lots of different terms. And it's actually Huxley, one of the Huxleys, not Aldous, the other one. Um, it's a paper in Nature in 1936. There you go. Terminal, it's basically, I'm going to have a Nature paper. I'm going to tell you how to use words, right? So that's what it is. Nice. Good for you. They don't do that anymore. Um, that's, I mean, I looked this up, and the, the paper after it is about eugenics. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You know, it's like, do not open all turtles. God, jeez. I'm not kidding. It's just like, you, there's a list of, uh, anyway. Now they just publish um, erroneous science, and that's kind of okay. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, they've dialed it back. Uh, may, I don't know, maybe they haven't. All right, hello, other. So, no, it's not working, all right? So, um, we do use it in different ways. So, it's often nonlinear scaling in this way. Um, yeah, so you, it, it can be this case where it's a dependent variable and an independent, or they just could be two interrelated things, whether you know, one is not a dependent thing. It could be just white, white and gray matter, right? So they're correlated things. That's often the case. So we'll use these in different ways. Okay. <coughs> All right. So we'll start with examples. On Thursday, I'm going to go back to this book. It's one of these Scientific American books from... The, I don't know if they still make these, but they, were, they get a couple of famous scientists and they produce a beautiful book. Uh, and it's from 1983, so that's a while ago. Um, from this great decade, and uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll have a look at this, and then we'll get into some examples, um, nails, cities, uh, all sorts of Moore's law, all that good stuff. Right.